get the right people together, get them in a room, review the insights, pick some things, get started, go launch something and drive value in three months. Hi, this is Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for leaders looking to accelerate value from their investments in customer experience and culture together. I'm really excited to speak today with Michelle, who's a CX and marketing veteran with experience at both larger companies like Wayfair, as well as working with emerging companies like private equity-owned portfolio companies uh, to accelerate value. So really excited to have you on the show today, Michelle. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me on. So you've led CX at a range of companies across industries such as retail, home improvement, real estate, health and wellness. Um, what are some of the lessons learned for how to accelerate value from investments and in customer experience? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to actually unwind it just a little bit because I think part of what needs to happen is also getting buy-in. Um, so before you can actually demonstrate that value, you have to get everybody bought in and, and kind of what you want to do. And the secret to that piece to me is really starting small. So especially when you come in new to an organization, but also if you're already established, instead of trying to bowl the ocean, because very often when you start looking at CX, you start identifying um, some fundamental issues that need to be addressed that are really big things. Um, it's tough to get buy-in from an organization. If you say, we need to overhaul the CRM, it's a really big project. And especially if you're new, you may not have the credibility to be able to do that. So what I've learned over time is that don't try to boil the ocean and start with some small wins that you can bring that back to the organization to help you build credibility so that when you want to go for those larger, bigger projects, you've already got everybody's buy-in because they trust you to be able to do that. So that's one. I think the second is don't just spend your time fixing what's broken. So very often I see CX professionals spending a lot of time listening to their insights and just focusing on what is broken at the moment. And it's I'm not in any way saying it's not important to build trust with your customers by making sure the fundamental components of your business are in place. Do that for sure. But then after that, you have the opportunity to really kind of lean into some of your even delighted customers to take them to that very next level and really kind of accentuate the positive. It's something that um, I did one time when I was at HomeServe and we took our customers that had given us a five-star review. And this was for a cold freezing day in the winter and they had a heating problem and we were able to very quickly go and resolve their heating issue. They were already delighted customers. They were super happy. But we went above and beyond and we just sent them these little custom socks with a HomeServe logo on it and a handwritten note that just said, hey, thanks so much for choosing HomeServe. Hope you don't need these again, but just in case. And it was just an over the top that drove a ton of social media and commentary and really positive exposure for the organization. So that to me would be a great example of how you shouldn't just focus on fixing what's broken. Do what you need to do to build that fundamental trust with your customers, but start thinking about where can you go above and beyond for your already happy customers. That'd be my second. I'll pause. Can I go to a third? There's always a third. It's things, great things come in threes, <laughs> in threes. so go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so the third one is really listen to the signal and not the noise. So I think what also I've seen happen with CX professionals is they have a variety of tools if they're lucky, and if not, they don't have tools and they're trying to do it some other way, um, of listening to what their customers want, what the problems are. And what I often see is that people are really focused on all, things that have a high level of frequency, but maybe aren't that important to their customers. Um, or maybe they're not actually listening to the right information in order to ascertain what's important to their customers. So making sure that you've got a really good voice of customer program in place that has not just your structured and your solicited data from your customers, from uh, surveys as an example, but that also includes the unstructured, unsolicited data, as well as your operational metrics around, you know, rage clicks on a website, as an example. 
and pull that information in and make sure that you're listening to those things that really matter to your customers. And it, you know, it sometimes comes in a matrix. It's not just frequency, right? There may be things that are small annoyances, but it's not really a huge turnoff to your customer. So you need to figure out how to incorporate sentiment into that. How is that really important? And then figure out how is that really important to the customer in terms of what they're trying to achieve with our organization, right? Those are two slightly different thing. Sentiment is how angry am I about it or how happy am I about it? Then the second version of sentiment is how much does that relate to what I'm actually trying to achieve in my interaction with you as a business? Two different kind of components of sentiment. And then effort for both the customer and the business. So thank you for that. You know, there's clearly a lot of value in um, in figuring out where to start and where to focus on the roadmap because CX is a team sport, and there's many different aspects of CX, whether it's the call center, the website, the mobile app, the the on-premise or in-store experience. We could keep going with all these different things that are part of customer experience. And if you're a leader that owns all of these things, you're well positioned to think about how to how to move ahead. But very often you have to build alignment and, and work through uh, getting the right members on the team to collaborate on the right opportunities. And then having insights that you can use along the customer journey. What are the, the if you think about it from a psychology perspective, what are the peaks and valleys in the customer experience? And I love your point about don't just drain the pain, don't just focus on reducing pain along the journey, but amplify existing peaks and also create new peaks, surprise and delight opportunities, which really creates that strong emotional connection and bond, which is amazing for brand love uh, to not just focus on reducing negatives, but actually amplifying and, and getting, you know, uh, punching behind your weight in social media because of that. It's a really great advice. Can I add to that too, which which I love is this idea of what I think people sometimes forget is once you have that emotional connection with your customers, they actually are willing to forgive a lot of your, I'll call them trespasses, right? Things that may go wrong in your customer experience. So that's why there's so much value in creating, I love that you said, creating additional peaks in addition to taking the peaks you already have and making them that much better. Because then when something goes wrong and you send out an email that doesn't have the right name in the subject line or whatever it may be, it'll it'll be okay. They, they won't, that won't cause them to leave. Whereas if you don't have that emotional connectivity that comes from those rich experiences and highly connective experiences, those things can lead to customer abandonment. And I think there's two paths that are, you know, we could explore here for a minute, if I could share. One would be, how do you create insights so that you have a, a you know, you're jump starting a process of deeper insights that you can use to ideate opportunities and then work on those opportunities in ways that are start small and then expand with the right proof of concept that don't get bogged down in three-year technology roadmaps that you can move really quickly. Um, you know, I say look three years out, but build today. You know, the key is to build today, not be constantly over the horizon on something that never comes. Um, or you do something and then it's a dead end and you don't know how to scale it. So I think one path is to build insights to go do stuff, whether it's the website, the app, the in-store experience, but that's more of a design thinking, agile prototyping, rapid test and learn path. And you have a lot of experience with that. Um, and another path is actually more people oriented, which is to understand the insights, but actually get your people to spot the insights. It's building this consciousness, this awareness of what good looks like. And actually, this is about behavior and mindsets of your people. And both paths are actually really valuable. But it's the, you know, when you look at what Disney or Ritz Carlton or Best Buy or others do, the people are actually a really important component of great CX. And, and, and the wow opportunities often are because people are proactive in doing things. It's, a, it's about culture. That's hence the name of the podcast, the CX and culture connection. And, you know, I would even parallel that to what some of what we see happening today, which is people talk a lot about kind of the two different types of AI. There's analytical AI and there's generative AI. And those two things alone, incredibly powerful, right? I would almost equate some of the listening that I'm talking about from a tooling perspective and the 
all of that would be like the analytical AI. And then the generative AI is that kind of people component. And when it gets really amazing is when you combine both of those things. And so I think that parallels with what you're saying too, in that, you know, you can, if you have these tools to be able to bring forth all of that analytical information, even though it's unstructured and unsolicited, it still can be configured together with that culture component. And you align both of them together. That's when you get the like just amazing. So let's, if it's okay, let's explore each of these two paths for a little bit. You know, when, when you think about kind of rapid piloting, rapid insights, you know, what's worked well, for example, with emerging companies with private equity owned companies to kind of build rapid insights and, and be able to make, you know, get points on the board quickly to drive value? Yeah. So I cheat. Um, and I cheat in the sense that um, I leverage a couple of tools that I've come across recently um, that I found incredibly valuable. One is called Spiral and the other is called Apex. Um, and there's a new one out. I haven't tried them yet called Worthix. But essentially, those tools enable you to aggregate all of your um, social media content and not just content, but responses together with anything that you have happening. If you happen to have a phone channel, which I think is one of the richest channels, um, as well as any type of a um, email, chat, all of those components. And it aggregates all of that information and it does that work for you and puts that overlay of sentiment together with frequency and kind of value to your organization. And then the work that I end up doing is I start looking at and working collaboratively with the organizations that I'm consulting with and say to them, okay, what's the level of effort in order to get this done, right? I only will have a superficial understanding of that because I don't work in the organization. And once you start to understand that level of effort for the organization, then you can start prioritizing some of these. And going back to my first point, which is just get some small wins on the board, figure out what are things that are relatively low effort for the organization, but will have a significant value to your customers. Do those quickly and get those out. And then you can start to tackle some of the meatier pieces as you go down that list. What you and I have talked about doing is creating a, um, a magic quadrant chart for a company where um, you can essentially think of one axis as the value to your customer, another axis as the ease of execution, and then the size of the bubble on the two by two is the value to your company. And what you want to do is pick something to do that is that high value, ease of execution, high value to you, top right, big bubble, go do something you know, go build some rapid insights, use it to prioritize what these bubbles are in your two by two and, and get going. And this is something I wrote about in the CX and culture connection in the book. Uh, if you look in the, in the, uh, uh, in the look chapter, you know, and, and, um, this is a methodology that Michelle and I can do with you. If you want to set up a, a diagnostic effort, you can very quickly go in, build insights and, and, and go get going on your piloting journey to drive value very quickly. And we're really excited to team. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, I can't, I, I don't feel like I can take any credit for it, Matt. You're the one who came up with the two, like, you know, with your consulting background and I think your classic consulting black background, that's how, that's kind of how your mind works, which is so fun to do. You simplify some of these more complicated concepts and, and that two by two is a, a great way to do that. But let's be really pragmatic as Michelle mentioned, and she's got a lot of great experience here. Um, go build insights really quickly that you don't need to do a long technology implementation to do a proof of concept to build some insights. Get the right people together, get them in a room, review the insights, pick some things, get started, go launch something and drive value in three months. Yep, It doesn't absolutely. have to be a long road to a small house. It can be a short road to a, an expanding house. Yep, absolutely right. To a modular home that you can continue to build on, I feel like. You know, what? what are some great um, examples of where, where you've been able to get results from this, you, whether from Wayfair or other, you know, where, do, where do you think is the, the low hanging fruit? Yeah. So, uh, I think a great example would be one of the recent engagements that, um, I had and, and we worked with a, this was a private equity firm. Um, and one of their portfolio companies was challenged with a relatively low cost product that for whatever reason, they had a lot of people that would go through the digital sales flow, but at one point they would pop out and it would go into the contact center. And from a cost perspective, it just wasn't tenable because 
the product didn't have enough value to it to really absorb all of that human in the loop interaction. And so what we did is we took some of these listening tools to listen to the phone calls and listen to some of their sales calls as well and help to identify what are the reasons why people are calling you in the first place? Why, why do they feel like the content and the tools that they have available to them on the website today aren't sufficient for them to be able to complete that transaction online. And so we were able to extract that information. And this was a really, this was an eight week engagement. We were able to extract that information from the contact center. And then we were able to incorporate that into their chat technology so that we could first, we, we did a lot of open-ended chats. So we just said, what are you looking to do today? You know, just, you know, Hey, how are you? Very open-ended. And once we started to aggregate that information, we would then set kind of presets for customers to be able to select in chat. And we would then go down to the next layer. As we got closer and closer to the sale, we would continue to take the open-ended, feed it back as presets, and we were able to narrow it down and then push as much volume as we could to stay within the digital flow because we had enabled both the content of the website, which the, the ownership there got a little tricky, um, but the, uh, the content of the website, as well as empower through the chat for customers to be able to, or prospects to stay within the flow to be able to become customers. So that was a very kind of narrow example, but the value that we brought to the organization was tremendous because the amount of calls that we have now deflected from going into the contact center um, had a significant cost value to them, right? If you think about how many, what's my cost per minute for an agent to be able to do this. And we extracted all of that from their contact center and we left the customer happier because they didn't really want to contact them. In some cases they did. It was interesting. This was, a, these were truckers. Um, and so sometimes they found themselves on the road and they just want to make a phone call. It's easier than trying to do anything on a phone hands-free. Um, but for the, for the rest of those cases, there was a huge opportunity there to, to bring value very quickly using that methodology. So just to build on Michelle's point for the audience, whether you're an emerging company, private equity owned company or larger company, what we're talking about here are taking a series of steps on journey. Your, co your company's on a journey too, not just your customer. Um, and how can you make this a self-funding journey through some of the cost savings that you're going to achieve? Um, so you know you can think of this as the cost of quality is one of the cost drivers that Michelle's talking about. If you reduce, if you have a better experience digitally, then there's less call volume, right? So this is called digital containment, right? So if a good digital experience, it actually results in lower costs, whether you're a retailer, you're a, a brand, a technology company, a healthcare company, financial services across industries, you can save 10 or 20 percent of the costs of service operations through this type of opportunities. So what Michelle's talking about is a continuous improvement cycle, starting with some small steps, using insights and getting things going where you're starting to build insights and attack cost of quality, which will also have the benefit of improving the CX. It doesn't just lower your costs. You can also look at things like your research and testing spend. I've seen apparel companies save 30 to 50% of their research and testing spend. Saw a bank save 30% of their user testing on their website and mobile apps. You know, there's a lot of opportunity to make your investments, particularly in digital self-funding because of the savings for research and testing. Um, and then finally, you know, you can, um, uh, you can also uh, have vendor rationalization. If you have 10 or 20 platforms that you're using, you can often get by with half as many by how you pick the right things. And, and, and Michelle has a wealth of experience implementing this. So she's a great partner to think through how do you actually make pragmatic trade-offs for what to do and how do you, how do you get on a path that's self-funding? And, and Matt, that, that last one, the technology piece, just from the specific consulting engagement that I had, it was so interesting that they had a different technology platform for sales chat versus for service chat. But the reality of it being is customers don't go in thinking that one is so distinct from the other. They just go and they want to chat. And the reality of it being is in about 70% of instances, the chat requests are service related. Um, and so it seemed to have this bifurcation resulted in an artificial barrier 
for both service and for sales. And what that also enabled us to do down the road was to start thinking about how do you commercialize some of those service engagements? You know, when it's right to think about it, but how do you take that moment when you have service and how do you think about, oh, you had a great service experience. By the way, I noticed Mrs. Smith, you don't have X, Y, and Z and you're a power user. I really think you might want to upgrade to version 2.0 of our platform so that you can get all of the benefits out of it. Um, And it goes to your point of, if you don't actually spend time thinking about all of the tooling that you have, you can actually have tooling that counters one another. And in this instance, they did have that. And so it is really important to take a look at the tech stack and see where you have opportunities to actually aggregate that. And not only is there a huge cost savings element to the organization from a contracts that you're paying for, but the number of people that are then supporting that technology, that also gets reduced on top of the servicing of your customers. So I've worked in many contact centers. And in those contact centers, I so often see agents work of working off of five different platforms on three different screens, trying to aggregate all the information. That time is money to be able to go to all these different systems. Once you start to think about how do I streamline that technology? And, and sometimes you're not going to get the best of every piece of ne- technology. You just need good enough. Um, because in my experience, in most of the use cases that clients have, they're really looking for kind of good to better. They're not necessarily going to be able to leverage some of those higher capabilities that the tools are getting anyway. And they get much more value out of being able to aggregate that tech stack. Um, and their employees end up being happier, which goes to your the kind of culture and customer experience and culture tie-in with employee experience. The happier your employees are and the easy it is for them to work and service your customers, the better the outcome for your customers as well. So I'm going to switch gears in a minute to dive deeper into the culture and employee connection there that I know we're going to have a lot of fun talking about. But just to close out what our listeners can do to take action on some of these things we've been talking about, connect with Michelle and me on LinkedIn and reach out over, send us a message, and we'd be happy to have a conversation with you privately on a video chat to explore some, if you found value in some of the concepts we just talked about, connect with us on LinkedIn, and we'll set up a meeting to talk with you about how this applies for you. So you once said, I love strategy, but culture wins. What a great quote. I mean, uh, by the way, Peter Drucker is yeah. Famous for saying culture eats strategy for breakfast, except he didn't actually say it. He's it's misquoted from him. And I <laughs> I learned that when I was writing my book that uh, I, I was gonna put that in and I went to footnote and I was like, wait a minute, he didn't actually say this. I couldn't I I, I he, he said something similar, but not quite the same thing. So um I love that quote. Your quote, I I love strategy, but culture wins feels similar. I'd love for you to elaborate. Uh, on this one, uh, what what it means for you and why you said it. Yeah. So I, I'm going to start with the story of how I got there because um, I definitely started out my career very focused on strategy. Um, and that was, I was kind of the classic academic when it came to that and always put together. I thought if you have the best strategy, you know, the company is going to win. My department's going to be great, whatever it may be. And um, I learned a very hard lesson. This was a um, extreme failure on my behalf in terms of how I managed my team. Um, And I had built a culture of fear um, in the organization that I I was leading. And it was really because I was um, relatively public in my um, kind of uh, disapproval of some of the ideas that my team members might have. Um, I did kind of all of the, these are the things you should never do (laughs) um, as a young leader. And um, and I I got feedback, which was great uh, from one of the people who ended up leaving my team. And I'm forever grateful to her. Um, for being kind enough to actually taking the time and telling me. And what I came to learn was, if people don't really like to work with you and for you, they're not going to do really good work because they just don't care for you. Um, And so I did a pretty significant pivot. And what I started to realize was, if I as a leader kind of came, and I know this word gets thrown around, I think it's Webster's most popular word or something like that authentically, but but if you show up as you, And if you lead in a manner that is open and transparent and enables trust in the environment because you yourself are vulnerable to others, what I have seen is that the teams that I have managed have been able to achieve that much more 
because they feel exceptionally comfortable bringing problems to the table. They feel exceptionally comfortable with having open discourse around those problems. They feel really comfortable with throwing spaghetti up at the wall and seeing what sticks and nobody feeling concerned that someone is going to negatively speak about something that they've, some idea that they've had, right? So, um, so that was the very hard lesson that I had to learn was I had to have somebody quit on me and tell me why they quit for me to realize that it was a culture issue and I had built a culture of fear. Um, and that the culture of empowerment is really where I needed to pivot to. So I spent the rest of my career focusing on that. And, and I think I've had a lot of success with it. Uh, um, and I say that only because I have people tell me afterwards and, and I have enjoyed working with the teams that I've created as a result. And what that enables, kind of the core takeaway for that for an organization is when you build those types of cultures, ideation and constant design thinking to me happens almost naturally. When you create those types of environments where people are, are feel free to be able to collaborate and speak openly with certain guardrails in mind, right? But, but in general, the output that you get and the result that you get as an organization is constant innovation, which is what you need because people are now bought in, they're passionate, they feel like they can have influence and impact on the business, which is what I think pretty much everybody when they go to work, if you're going to spend eight hours, 10 hours a day doing what you're doing, you want it to be meaningful. It's taking you away from a whole bunch of other stuff. So let's make sure that you can in that time actually make a difference and have an impact. So I know that was a long-winded answer to your question, but um, but that's how I got to, I love strategy, but culture wins. Thanks for making it personal. I think any any time there's a personal story there, it's more meaningful, and and that's how we all change and learn and gr- learn and grow is sharing stories. You know, I'd love to kind of dive a little bit deeper into what are some of the specific things to pay attention to if you want to build a, a culture that has the right behaviors, the right mindsets, the right networks and collaboration, right? You know, to make the culture to change how things are done around here. And it starts with individuals, but ultimately you have to build a movement where people's behavior is changing. So what are some of the things to pay attention to as a leader to kind of spark that movement to get that culture changing? Yeah. So I don't know if I'm going to answer your question exactly. And I know you, you've got a lot of really great ideas around this and structure around it. So um, I would say some of the things to pay attention to are, um, how how you come to the table as a leader, for sure. Um, and going back to the points I made before around authenticity and around vulnerability. So leadership development and being paying attention to yourself and, and practicing things like mentalizing and thinking about others and how are you engaging with others? Yes. And I think opening yourself up to the the kind of personal aspects of yourself in a business environment. I know for a long time, I was taught your personal life is your personal life and you don't bring that to work and work is work. And the reality of it being is we're humans and you can't put that wall between the two. And I don't think it's natural to put the wall between the two. And I have found that um, actually work environments where you are given more space and more freedom around bringing the personal elements of yourself forward are the ones that are the most engaged environments. So that to me is, again, as a leader, I, to me, it just feels like what I have seen success with is if you demonstrate it, if you you don't just talk the talk, but you you really walk the walk and you come into your meetings. And I've often, very simple, I have started meetings with some type of personal tidbit about something I did on the weekend or something that happened to me or a lesson I learned um, or gosh, I just came back from a meeting and I really did not do well in that meeting. Here are the lessons learned that I want to share with you guys so you don't step in that pile of poo, right? So moments like that, I think, are very helpful in creating in starting to establish a culture on your team, for sure. Um, and I would say then kind of the pieces that you have to watch for and and look to see, is this effective? Is this not effective? Is whether or not you start seeing people open up and engage in discourse. That to me was one of the th- main things that happened when I was at Wayfair. I had um, kind of absorbed a team of uh, data analysts that had had a very different leader prior to myself. 
And um, once they came onto the team, I, what I first noticed was there wasn't a lot of discourse. There wasn't a lot of challenge of some of the things I was putting out there. And I would continuously say, look, I'm not a data analyst. It, in my next life, I'd like to be one, but I'm not today. So tell me where I'm not thinking about this the right way. How would you do this differently? And in the beginning, super hesitant. And when one person finally spoke up and I thanked them so openly in a meeting and I said, that's a great idea. You're absolutely right. I was thinking about it the wrong way. It, the other team members began to recognize that this was the type of environment where you could have freedom. So watching for, do you feel like people have freedom in their conversations when you hold meetings or even when you have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with them is one of the, to me, huge indicators of success when it comes to culture or failure. What you're highlighting is you can showcase and model behaviors that you want. So you can become more self-aware of the behaviors yourself. You can invite others to engage in those behaviors too. And you're creating an environment where the behaviors can take root. Now, what's really powerful about this is not only, you know, do you get people bought into the idea of being part of the change together and drawing energy from each other and like energy flows people that's basically cultures about positive flow of energy versus negative flow of energy. Um, but you can be intentional about the behaviors you want in your culture. And this is a step many leaders miss, which is what behaviors do I want in my culture? Reflect about it yourself, certainly, and about how you can, you know, create those. But if you want to create an ID8 test scale approach with a culture of experimentation, well, then how do you drive ideation? How do you create psychological safety? How do you get people contributing? Those are all behaviors around fostering more ideation. If you want more ideation, don't do things that inhibit it, you know, um, but you can actually step back and engage some of your people. I call them your culture champions about who are, what are the behaviors you want and get them to be part of shaping the selection of these behaviors. And then how are you going to activate the behaviors? And the missing step often is to make commitments. I would encourage, um, if you haven't already for the audience, go to, um, www.cxandcultureconnection.com and look for the podcast episode with Chris Taylor. He's the CEO of Actionable. It's a platform that I use for change management and cultural behavior activation and understand like how do you get people to make commitments? And then Chris has this great method that I love called the triple double. If you look at the behaviors and the commitments people are making, you can actually get a bell curve of like, you know, who's applying the behaviors. And this is one of the things we do is actually get people to make commitments and then track behaviors. And you can look at the bell curve. Now, the people on the right side of the bell curve are the ones who are doing it great. And actually, those are the ones you want to amplify. It's like in social media, you want to amplify them. You want to get them to share their stories. That's called doubling down. It's a triple double. So you want to double down on those people and showcase those stories. Then in the um, middle is a double click. You need to understand why aren't they adopting it? What else could I do? How do I get it to the next level so you can get them to be performing like the ones on the far right of the bell curve? The far left of the bell curve are the ones that are not getting it. They're not adopting it. These are doubling back. You got to engage people in the program and actually ask, is it worth it to engage with these people? Or are we going to move on? Or should we double back and figure out how to, so this is a change management mindset, but explicitly focusing on behaviors, because that's the most critical thing in culture is, is, is behavior adoption, because you act your way into new mindsets via commitments. Yeah. And I, I really like that very deliberate approach. I don't know that I've ever been that deliberate in terms of what, what do I want the culture necessarily to be? And going back to your point, you know, if you want a culture of um, innovation, well, okay, what are, what are the behaviors that we know will drive innovation and work that back into, okay, what are the behaviors that I need to exhibit, hold everybody accountable for and collaborate with them in order to determine how do I, how do we achieve those behaviors in the end? So I really like that idea of more structured thought around the culture piece. And you don't have to start from scratch, 
because usually there's something already present in an organization culturally that's the foundation because of what I what I call a cornerstone discipline to build on. A corner in, in construction, the cornerstone is the first stone you lay, and then everything's built on top of that. So you might already have a commitment and buy-in, say, to human-centered design. And so and you might say, okay, well, we want it. There people are this design thinking is popular. People have been exposed to it. How do we build on that? Well, there's a set of behaviors around design thinking that you can spread in the organization. You could also, you might say, you know what, we want, we're committed to agility and we're trying to drive agility. Well, there's certainly a lot of rituals and behaviors associated with agility. Same thing for quality management, actually for data science also. So these are four examples of disciplines that I write about in, in the book that you can actually use that as a launching off point for what behaviors you want. You don't have to have a blank sheet of paper. You could actually say, if I want to f- combine human-centered design and agility, let's go look at the behaviors that are well aligned to those disciplines and ski downhill and actually drive those in my organization and look, look for what's present today. How do I amplify it? That's the doubling down, you know, and, and how do I spread it? What I love about the culture approach to all of this, which I I know you've gotten the message on it, obviously, because you're so adamant about it. But from a scale perspective, when I think about customer experience and really creating scalable customer experiences, the only way that I can think of doing that consistently is through culture. Um, If you within the organization, because otherwise, let me just take a step back before I get to that. Otherwise, as a CX group, typically, you you sit in not quite a silo, right? Because you want to be co- cooperating and collaborating with a lot of other groups in the organization, but you are not the one who can actually implement the change. And you may have somebody in finance who decides they're going to make a decision about a new price point that they're going to apply. And they're not going to think about how does that influence the customer experience? And that is a component of customer experience. But when you've put in a culture if it's design oriented thinking, if it, whatever that culture may be, well then the people in other departments will start thinking in a manner that is similar, that will all have the similar outcome that everybody has decided that they want to have being the outcome. Right. And so that to me is the best way to be able to scale true, great customer experiences really through culture. So if this is an area that you see value in, you know, in, in our, among our listeners and talking to our listeners, some simple things you could do um, are, you know, uh, if you have a leadership team meeting or an offsite, Michelle and I would love to come be a speaker or to come facilitate a breakout at your offsite and and dive deeper into some of these topics. And we'd certainly be happy to talk about that. Yeah, clearly we're both really passionate about it. You know, when you think about uh, earlier in the conversation, you talked a little bit about AI and about leveraging AI for some applications in marketing and commerce. I'd love to get your thoughts, given um, you know how much attention AI is getting. I feel like I talk about it on every podcast. Um, certainly, do a lot in this area. It's a lot of it's getting a lot of focus right now. Um, what do you see as some of the best opportunities to apply AI as part of CX? You know, wh- wh- where is it now? Where do you think it needs to go? I will be one of the first people to say, I don't think that AI is going to be a replacement of the human anytime soon. I think very specifically within the customer service element of customer experience, there's uh, there have been some questions around that. You know, do I now replace my agents and I now have AI? That That's not where I think the main value of AI sits. I think it's augmentation of the human. And to me, some of the most exciting opportunities within CX Um, do sit within customer service, but certainly also within kind of your marketing acquisition funnel as well. So I'll speak about the customer service piece. The the opportunities there, I think, are really around, um, one, there's some analytical uh, AI that you can apply to think about what are your really channel preferences for your customers for certain types of interactions? You can start getting some data and start understanding look, the best resolution for a really complicated issue is not going to be a chat session. It's probably going to be a phone call. So start informing your organization around these complicated issues are going to go here. These less complicated issues are potentially going to be resolved in another channel. And then also change that presentation to the customer as well so that they have the best likelihood of a good outcome based upon the channel, right? So that, that would be one interesting place for application of analytical AI. 
When I think of generative AI, I think there are two elements within customer service that I get really excited about. And one is for agent assist. Um, and that's really to help anytime you have a human in the loop, help that human be more efficient in how they serve their customers and take some of the mundane work that they may have to do. So things like a call wrap or um, indicating what the call reason was or any follow-up notes around a phone call, take that out of the hands of the agent and automate those elements. And that actually doesn't even need generative AI. The generative AI can then actually take, let's say that full phone call that you have and now can summarize it so that the next person that touches that customer has a summary of their experience. Those are the places where I think I get really excited because what that ultimately means that can happen is as a business, you can have employees in your contact center that are really focused on the more challenging, empathetic work that they should be doing versus focused on really the more mundane work that very often they end up doing. Um, and once you build some of these elements to help your, uh, human, your humans in the loop in that service experience, two things happen. One is those people are happier and that you have more retention. So when you think about that value equation that we started talking about at the top of the session, right there, you're going to gain value. You're going to reduce your attrition rates within the contact center. That's incredibly expensive when you have people turn over and you'll have less of that because they're doing Some less. companies have 100% turnover in their contact center in a year. Oh, I've, I've worked with That's ones really that have, 100, yeah. have 120%. Um, yeah. And it, it's, they're not outliers. That's, that's what's mm -hmm. fascinating to me. So when you think about being able to stem that because you've taken out the mundane, huge opportunity there. And then the other thing that it enables, and this is where I think we have to be really deliberate as leaders in thinking about implementation of AI is, well, you may actually now be opening up 30% bandwidth for each person. And instead of thinking of that as necessarily, okay, well, now I don't need to hire as many people, which will absolutely be true. There'll be value from the ability to scale now, now that you've implemented some of this generative AI and even analytical AI. But the other component of that is you can now allow these people to do other work. And it could go back to that point we were making at the top of the hour, which is these are very often your boots on the ground and they know what customers really, really want. Now you can open up time to them. I think of, I think Google did this at one point in time. They let every employee have like 30% of their day or their time allocated towards, you know, fun projects, something that could maybe benefit the business. You could think of something similar and give this time back to these people to say, look, you know what customers want, help us deliver it and enable them to actually do that. So um, I think implementation in the customer service space gets me really excited. And then on the marketing side of the house, I think there's just so much opportunity in being able to now do hyper personalization and communications with your customers, um, figuring out, you know, based upon past activity. And, and now you can, you know, you've got these giant data sets, you can actually do something with them. Everybody, I think of Wayfair, right? Wayfair, we used to laugh about it internally. If I bought uh, and, and I did this, I bought a patio set. So I bought a table and chairs. And um, the next email that I got from them was, hey, buy this patio set, table and chairs. And I was like, do you not know that I just bought this? And oh, by the way, the one that you presented to me looks exactly the same, but it's $20 cheaper than the one that I bought. So now it's like insult upon injury. Not only do you not know who I am, but on top of that, <laughs> you're actually giving me something at a lower price. And so now we have that opportunity to leverage AI to be able to say, oh, okay, now you've done that. Well, let's get you some seat cushions. So that should be my next marketing offer to you. Or, oh, based upon all of the data that I have, predictably, people that purchase these types of outdoor patio sets, the next thing that they purchase is something in the kitchen and offer that, right? So, so being really smart about how we can continuously commercialize our experiences in ways that are really relevant to our customers. For the audience, if you want to check out a prior podcast that talks about using AI to personalize content experiences for marketing, like Michelle's talking about, go to cxandcultureconnection.com and look at the episode for Ronnie Vexelman from Optimove. So he's talking all about this, how you can drive micro-segmentation with AI and basically it learns based on journey orchestration what people have done before, what the next best piece of content is to serve up in an email or a message or content on a website. 
Uh, it's really cool stuff. And Michelle's talking about practical things for how you embed this in the organization. Um, but check out that podcast too, if you want to learn more about that or, or reach out to us and set up a discussion, we'd be happy to talk about it some more. Um, Michelle, as we wrap up, it's been fantastic conversation. I want to give you an opportunity to share, uh, you know, the best way for people to follow up with you, whether it's the website of your company or other ways, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Yeah. So Saicho Syndicate, um, Saicho spelled S-E-I-C-H-O Syndicate. Um, that's the Japanese word for growth. Um, and, uh, and you can find me there. Um, and my email is michelle at saichosyndicate.com. Um, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions and engage in any way. I'm always uh, very excited to talk about anything related to CX, which these days now feels like everything because <laughs> almost everything's related to CX. Absolutely. Um, Michelle, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you've definitely sparked some great ideas for me. I, I, I know you have for the audience as well. Um, and uh, thanks for coming on today. Such a joy. Thanks so much for having me, Matt.